Good evening, everyone. Watching my son David climb over my seventh floor balcony and falling to his death was the most horrific event of my life. My attempt to grab him was futile and all I could do was scream. The days and weeks that followed were a numb confusion as my daughters Brian Lalit and I grappled with the reality that David is no longer with us. For me, there were two dominating thoughts. Firstly, I could not understand why I felt no guilt about his death. David and I had quarreled incessantly about the way his bipolar disorder should be handled. And as I now felt I may have been wrong, I therefore sh should feel guilty. Secondly, I had the overwhelming feeling that his life had been completely wasted because he had not fulfilled his wish to help fellow sufferers in a meaningful way. The nights were no different, except that my sleep was rather fitful and every few nights I relived the sight of David's tumble to death. However, one night was different. I woke from the recurring nightmare and then it hit me that I could possibly help him achieve in death what he was unable to accomplish in life. I would write a book which would show him how the system had failed him. And if only a few others would benefit, then David's life would have had meaning. I decided we would make it a family affair. I could hardly wait to speak to my daughters. It was soon apparent that my enthusiasm was shared by them. Our main reasons for writing the book were, firstly, to help bring about changes that would benefit patients in South African hospitals for the mentally ill. We thought that much of the trauma David experienced as a bipolar sufferer could have been reduced. Secondly, we felt that reading about the manner in which David and our family tried to handle his illness would be of practical use and interest to family and friends of the mentally ill. Thirdly, the entire net proceeds earned by the sale of the book would be used to promote human rights causes and mental health awareness. And lastly, writing the book um, was really to help meet our own needs. Our family's trying to come to terms with David's untimely death, so we thought that writing this book would help the healing process. We decided to call the book Too Difficult to Explain, which was one of David's catchphrases as a child. We hoped we would learn from David's experiences and that explaining would not be too difficult. I was born and educated in Johannesburg, where I met my wife Adelaide, also known as Addie. When I met Ali, she was in the final year of her honours degree in social work. Her thesis was about the need for halfway houses to help the mentally ill recover. It is remarkable that almost 60 years later, there is still the same need. In 1960, we moved to the UK because we disliked and disagreed with apartheid. We ended up living in Petersham near Richmond, where our three children, Brian, Lalit and David, were born. They were all very different. Brian and Lalit were academic, whereas David did poorly at school, but excelled at sport, particularly tennis, which was his passion. Much later on, we discovered that he was dyslexic, not a slow learner as we'd been told. My shorthand for my children was Brian the brainy, Lalit the arty, and David the sporty. <laughs> In the book, Lalit recalls David's life from birth to bar mitzvah through a series of snapshots. When David was in his teens, we did not heed two warnings that he might need professional medical help and career guidance. David visited Israel on a tennis playing holiday 
and it did not work out as planned. He stayed with my uncle, who was a GP. My uncle said that David had been difficult to control at times, and that he thought we should take him to see a psychiatrist. Unfortunately, we ignored his advice. David was a talented tennis player who wanted to play pro tennis. But unfortunately, he was not quite good enough. His life collapsed when he just missed a place on the reserve list for the national tennis team. This led to him having an emotional breakdown and we organised recovery treatment at the Priory Hospital before it became famous, of course. When he came out of the Priory Hospital, he told me he had decided to give up tennis. I tried unsuccessfully to persuade him to try coaching. We did not take David's breakdown seriously, particularly as the psychiatrist did not seem to think we should. In hindsight, we should at least have ensured that he obtained expert career advice. In 1996, our family was shocked by the sudden and early death of my mother, Addie, when David was 28. Her untimely passing had a greater effect on David than we realised at the time. David went on a wonderful trip to South Africa in early 1998 <coughs> to visit Brian, who had moved to Cape Town prior to Addie's death. He came back full of enthusiasm for South Africa and a dislike for England, especially as the return coincided with our wedding anniversary and also the anniversary of Addie's death. David became depressed and was admitted as a voluntary patient to Queen Mary's University Hospital, where he was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, and he spent most of the year in and out of hospital. In December, he visited South Africa with me to investigate the job market, but employment prospects were not good, and he was definitely depressed. Upon our return to London, he tried to commit suicide by driving his car into a wall and, as a result, had to return to hospital for a few months. In 1999, I decided to return to South Africa, living in Cape Town. I tried to persuade David to join me, but he declined because he was no longer in hospital and had found accommodation in a halfway house called Kingston Lane. A halfway house is a temporary home for patients with mental health problems who were no longer required to stay in hospital. Staying at the halfway house apparently proved to be a success because David had no need to return to hospital for about two years. In 2008, an attractive flat became available for a halfway house resident for independent living. And because David was coping so well, it was offered to him. Unfortunately, living alone did not work out as expected. And when he made an unsuccessful job change, he became severely depressed and had to go back into hospital. Chad immediately flew to England, and he and David decided that it would be best if David came to Cape Town with him. Bad social work was, in my opinion, the trigger for David's depression and breakdown. He should have been visited or contacted at least once or twice a week when he moved into the flat on his own. Had this happened, it is most likely that he would have been taken back to the halfway house immediately. The social worker did not even know that he had changed jobs and, most importantly, had left the new job. David loved the life in Cape Town, but practical adjustment was difficult for him. He lived with me initially. Consulting a private psychiatrist for David did not work. When he was sent to a private clinic, the facilities were good, but the nursing staff knew nothing about treating mentally ill patients. He became a voluntary patient 
and subsequently an outpatient at Falkenberg Hospital, the state psychiatric hospital in Cape Town, which David used to refer to as the Big V. Much more successful was his return to playing table tennis. He chose to play at St Giles, where most of the players were disabled. He also started studying for a sports management diploma, which he later passed with flying colours, despite being hospitalised at the time. Living with me proved to be less successful than we both hoped, and he left to live at Salou House, a private residential home for the psychiatrically frail, owned and run by a group of doctors. The move to Salou House was initially good, but David constantly took the part of other residents who, he said, were being pressurised to undergo various types of treatment at Falkenberg, which he thought were barbaric. Chad warned David that the owners would not brook his interference, and he was later proven correct when David was asked to leave Salou House. A few weeks later, David had a manic episode, and he arrived at Salou House stark naked. He gained entry and then trashed everything in sight and unfortunately also bit one of the residents. He then tried to escape by climbing over the gate and impaled himself on a wrought iron spike. An ambulance and the fire brigade arrived but they were too scared to lift him off the spike so he was taken to hospital along with the gate and with the spike still impaled through his armpit. And I just have memories of that and it was really awful and just like really just funny as well at the same time because uh, he had this massive <laughs> spike through, through his um, armpit. Um, when David uh, was in hospital um, waiting he got fed up with waiting for the doctors to remove the spike so he actually pulled it out of the armpit himself. Um, a couple of days later one of the doctors from Salou House delivered the final blow by telling us that there was a possible charge of attempted rape against David. The psychiatrist at Falkenberg stated that in his opinion, David had not known what he was doing and should be made a state patient. Dad and I agreed that we should do everything to prevent David from being sent to jail, and we decided to support the psychiatrist in making David a state patient. We were then told that the possible charge of attempted rape had been changed to a charge of rape. We believe that the charge should never have been made and a number of years later, a nurse who had been in the same room as the complainant when David entered it, stated that David had bitten the complainant's arm but had never attempted to rape her. Despite the fact that the police never investigated the matter, the staff at Falkenberg continually referred to David as a rapist. Our immediate worry that David might lose his arm was removed, but his life was completely changed after the charge of rape. A state patient in South Africa effectively loses all their independence. And much of the book um, we've written describes what this meant for David. David's experience at Falkenberg hit rock bottom when he was forcibly injected with haloperidol because he refused to take his usual medication, clozapine which was not available in injection format. <coughs> Both these drugs are antipsychotic. David was hypersensitive to heliporidol, and as a result of the injection, he was unable to control his tongue, and he ended up biting it severely. The doctors thought his speech might be impaired for life as a result. In my opinion, the nurse who injected him had handled him with complete lack of sympathy, care or understanding. David's tongue fully recovered, but he remained traumatised by the incident until his death. When I received David's medical records at the end of 2010, almost two years after his death, it became clear that the hospital had slipped up when they injected him with a haloperidol. The records clearly showed that David's sensitivity to 
Hello, Paradil, had been established when he was a voluntary patient at Falkenberg, and that he should not have been given that particular medicine. Unfortunately, the warning was not displayed on the front of his file. This plus other revelations led me to a change in direction for the book and added a further two years to its completion. I consider my relationship with David to have been very good throughout his life. The one important aspect where I failed was in trying to get him to take his medication consistently while he was living with me in South Africa. Unfortunately, medication non-compliance is a system of bipolar disorder and withdrawal can trigger episodes of mania and depression. Because he kept going off his medication, David had manic episodes on average about once every nine months. After an episode, it became necessary to stabilise his mood in hospital. After recovery, he was given a weekend leave, then if he did well, a weekly amount of leave, and then finally he could take monthly leave. <laughs> Taking leave was encouraged because of the shortage of beds at the hospital. Once a month, he had to return to hospital to collect the next month's medication, have his blood tested and see a psychiatrist. Provided the latter was satisfied with David's state of mind, he was automatically given a further month's leave. The procedures were simple, but David trembled for days before the visit and then needed further days to recover. David became a mental health activist as soon as he became a state patient. He appeared to be more interested in fighting the system than gaining his freedom from the hospital. Our late mother, Addie, became his role model because she was a psychiatric social worker who had successfully fought causes in and out of work, and David desperately wanted to emulate her. One of David's achievements was being interviewed by Linda Lindblom, a Swede, who is a specialist in human rights issues, and working, she works for the Swedish International Development Corporation Agency. She wrote an article about David with the title, The Law Has Been the Instrument of Our Oppression, which was published in the magazine Human Rights Africa in 2007. Another achievement was David's contribution to establishing an independent South African user and survivor organisation. One less successful but hilarious achievement was when David and his friends decided to produce a video in celebration of World Mental Health Day in 2008. It was called Escape to Robin Island. <laughs> Filmed by another activist, <laughs> David Lewis, it showed David being examined by doctors because of a serious outbreak of normalcy at a mental hospital ward in Cape Town. This resulted in patients escaping to Robin Island. <laughs> Most of the recording was done at the Medical Hospital Museum in Cape Town. And when Chad asked which parts were shot on the island, he was sheepishly told that they never got to Robin Island because no one had booked seats on the ferry and all the boats going there were full. David was a good mimic and the video ended with him delivering a passable imitation of Mandela. Chad decided not to ask David Lewis whether Madiba was escaping to or from Cape Town. The psychiatrists and other professionals whom I interviewed for the book were generally helpful and encouraging. One of them was the outpatient doctor at Falkenberg when David was a voluntary patient and a friendship developed between them. He believes that I was right to have written about David and has in fact contributed to the book. He introduced me to a number of professionals in the mental health field whom I interviewed subsequently. David did not get on well with the majority of psychiatrists who were treating him at Falkenberg. To try and prevent them reacting negatively to him, I made sure that I cooperated with them. My examination of David's medical files later on revealed that it might have been better if I had been less cooperative and more demanding, particularly in relation to the tongue-biting incident. One of the psychiatrists at Falkenberg informed me that he had been instrumental in blocking an application by David to move 
to an excellent residential home run by Comcare, an organisation providing accommodation for the mentally ill. His sole concern was that if Falkenberg gave David permission to live at the Concord home and David became violent, this would reflect badly on Falkenberg's decision to allow David to live there. He had no thought whatsoever for David's well-being and he never discussed the matter with either David or me subsequently. When I interviewed him for the book, he was completely unaware of the effect of his action had had on David. This complete lack of cooperation continued after David's death. One of the psychiatrists tried to prevent me obtaining access to David's medical files. Luckily, the South African Human Rights Commission soon obtained a reversal of this act of prevention, which was completely illegal. One of my main complaints about the mental health system in South Africa is that Falkenberg has no plans whatsoever for helping David to integrate into the community, even though his monthly leave made him, like it or not, a member of the community. I must make it clear, this is more of a complaint against the system in South Africa and the lack of resources than a criticism of the psychiatrists. Nevertheless, it results in some psychiatrists making it very clear who is in charge and revealing an arrogance which I found difficult to accept. The metaphorical walls of our hospitals that our system creates are also responsible for some psychiatrists becoming as institutionalized as their long-term patients. David made many harsh remarks about Falkenberg and the South African mental health scene, but I met a number of people and organizations described in the book who present the other side of the coin. The availability of suitable accommodation for the recovering mentally ill patients <coughs> is not in abundant supply in Cape Town. Comcare, which provides good permanent homes, is described in the book, but more of this accommodation is clearly needed. Salou House, in spite of their lack of understanding of David, provides a very good model. It is Chad's belief that the future of mental health treatment does not lie with bigger and better hospitals, but requires smaller specialist hospitals, plus a variety of private and publicly owned accommodation homes catering for short and long-term stays. My first idea for improving the mental health system in South Africa was to have an ombudsman type person, a psychiatrist, situated at all the large hospitals with smaller hospitals sharing a psychiatrist. I then realised that there were not sufficient psychiatrists available to fill even a small fraction of the numbers required. The idea nevertheless seemed good, and this led to my suggestion that a maestro ombudsman be appointed at one hospital. His, her main task would be to produce a new model for mental health treatment in South Africa. While conducting research for the book, I learned about the recovery system, which is a model that aims to help people with mental health problems to look beyond mere survival and existence. <coughs> One of the main features of recovery is that the patient is part of a team and they work together to help take control of their own life, focusing on them, not just their symptoms, and helping them become more integrated within the community. The recovery system is now being used at the same halfway house, Kingston Lane, where David lived in 1999, and it's very much better than the old system they were using. Moreover, the Halfway House is part of the first mental health trust in the United Kingdom to use the recovery approach. The trust even has a recovery college, and you can read more about this in the book and online. David's experiences of treatment in public and private mental health hospitals in both England and South Africa is possibly unique. Well, what have I deduced from all of this? Firstly, 
The halfway house system in England worked extremely well for David as he did not have a psychotic episode for a period of two years while living in Kingston Lane. Secondly, I believe that although the psychiatrists in Falkenberg were able to stabilise David after a psychotic episode, the mental health system in South Africa was incapable of doing anything to keep him away from the regular recurrence of his psychotic episodes. I believe that the fundamental problem is that once a patient is less hostile, there's very little put in place to help them adjust to life. I'd like to conclude with the thought that David might have been alive today if methods like recovery had been in use in South Africa when he needed it. And that's it.